Let's open our Bibles this afternoon to the book of Philemon, right after the book of Titus, which is right after the book of First and Second Timothy, I think, yes. First, Second Timothy, First, Second Thessalonians, First, Second Timothy, then Titus, then Philemon. I've been doing a series of teachings entitled Faith Comes 20 Ways. Now, actually, faith comes more than that. There's a lot of little tributaries. But I've been doing a message on each one of the ways that faith comes. So we're talking about the way that faith comes, number 16. Now, I labeled these numerically, but that doesn't mean that's the order they're in. They're not prioritized, per se. It's just how faith comes. And actually, there are so many things I'd like to share. I wish we had more opportunities, and maybe we will at a future date. But I want you to realize, and I cannot overemphasize, the absolute, complete necessity of faith. You must have faith. Amen. All things were made by God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost by faith. They had faith in themselves. Amen. They had confidence in themselves. They said, if we deny him, he cannot deny himself. So, I don't exactly understand it. All I know is that faith is a spiritual, invisible substance. We understand by faith, the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen not, were not made of things which do appear. And we know there's many descriptions for the word faith in the New Testament other than the word believe in the Old Covenant was called the word trust. But, de, but, but Paul said one thing right before he left this earth in the book of 2 Timothy. He said, I have fought the good fight I have kept the faith. So it is a fight of faith. Say a fight of faith. fight of faith. I mean, it's going to be a fight for you to love God, follow God, obey God, serve God, surrender to God, submit to God, to give to God everything. It will be a fight. It will be the greatest fight you've ever had. And it's a good fight because a good fight is the fight that you win. Now, now, you know, even when you look in the world, when you look at two men who get into the arena and they're fighting over the championship of who's going to be the next heavyweight boxing champion, listen, both opponents are going to come out of that ring bloodied up and busted up and bruised up. It, there's, there, listen, I don't know why people think that when you fight the fight of faith that it says everything is hunkadory, peaches and cream, cotton candy, there is no bruises. You know, David said, it was good for me that I was afflicted that I might learn thy statues. Amen. And it tells us in the book of James, it says, the trying of your faith worketh patience. And, and Peter said, don't be surprised at the fiery trial which is about to try you. Say, fiery trial. Fiery. You know, I've always said this, either we're just coming out of a test, we're in a test, or we're headed into another test. Amen. So either we're coming out or we're in or we're headed into one. And that's just how it is. When I used to be in the Navy, that's how it was. Either you were coming out of a storm, you were in a storm, or you're headed into a storm. I mean, that's just how life is. And see, this is a fight of faith. So what the enemy is after is to destroy your confidence, your trust, your dependence, your reliance upon God. Now, Jesus came to bring man back into that realm of faith. See, before man committed sin, that's where he lived. I mean, that was his natural habitat, just like the ocean is the habitat for fish or the heavens are the habitat for eagles or birds that, that sail on the wind or, 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 you know, the habitat of a worm is dirt. Hello? I mean, I'm glad I'm not that kind of worm. How about you? But the habitat of the believer is faith. Now, the habitat for those who don't know Christ, who aren't walking with Christ, who aren't believing Christ, who ain't trusting Christ, it says the way of the sinner is, is, is hard. That, that's the realm of unbelief, where you don't trust God, you don't depend upon God, you don't rely upon God, you don't look to God, you don't cast your cares upon Him, you, 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 you don't follow Him. I mean, that, the way the, the sin is pleasure for a season, but then comes forth death. So you and I, we have to fight to get back to where we belong, like the salmon when it begins to go up the river to get back where it hatched. We've got to fight to get back where we belong. And your feelings and your emotions and your circumstances and your neighbors and your in-laws or outlaws, I mean, everything in life is going to disagree with you getting to where you need to be spiritually. And the only way to apprehend that is by faith. So we're going to talk about another way that faith comes. And, 
And, and this one, we're going to have to kind of do a little bit of digging because it's a little bit of a mystery, but I can prove it to you as we look at it. There in chapter three, in, in, in Philemon chapter 1, excuse me, Philemon chapter 3, in verse 4. No, that's what. See, I got my chapter covered up. Chap, there is no chapter. I'm going, what is going on here? So, there is no chapter 3. It's just chapter 1. I'm going, Father, I know better than that. What happened? Did you give us some extra chapters? I thought, man, I didn't read that yet. Look there in verse 4. I thank my God. I thank my God making mention of these all, the always in my prayers. Listen. Hearing of thy love and what? Faith. Notice that it's so important. We've got to have love and faith. And matter of fact, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says, now abide in faith, hope, and love. So we've got to have faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. But notice, you've got to, but can I tell you this? Did you know before you ever had love, you had faith? Because you had to have faith in Christ. And once you accepted Christ, then the love of God was shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost that was given unto us. Amen. And so you had to have faith, but now that you've got faith, it needs to be motivated, and we need to be led and guided by compassion or by love. And it says, faith which worketh by love, and it says, the love of Christ constraineth us. So it says, listen to this, it says, having, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast towards who? The Lord Jesus, first of all, our faith and our love. Notice, faith and love is directed to Jesus Christ, and then it's directed to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. So the very first thing it says, if, if you don't love your brother who, whom you have seen, how can you love God whom you have not seen? So if I really love God, I will love you, even if you're a stinker, even if you're not nice even if you're rude, even if you're not sociable. Some people are not sociable. I will still love you because Christ is at work in me because faith, how many know it takes faith to love some people? Hello, it does. It takes faith to love some people. Don't look around. <clears throat> it says, hearing of thy love and faith, which I has towards the Lord Jesus and towards all saints, that the communication of thy faith, the communication of thy faith. Now let me read this, and then I kind of want to unscramble this a little bit because you'd have to really look at this in the Greek. And a lot of translations don't even translate this correctly. It's an amazing set of scriptures. Awesome. That the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging, say by the acknowledging, of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Actually, the King James is probably one of the closest translations to this particular set of scriptures. So he says this, Paul said, by the Spirit of God, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Now, now, how many know what the word acknowledgement means? Acknowledgement means when you admit or declare something that is true. Correct? Amen. So, when somebody says something to you, like, oh, you got blue eyes. Yeah, I do have blue eyes. Oh, you're pretty smart, aren't you? Yeah, I'm pretty smart. Huh? For in other words, somebody said something to you that is obvious, and you acknowledge it. Now, I'm going to show you that faith will come to you when you begin to acknowledge every good work that he's done inside of you. Now let's, let's and I'm going to show you this is biblical. For instance, when it says in 1 John 4, 4, which we'll probably close with that particular scripture, it, listen, it says, for greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So when you begin to acknowledge that to yourself, the communication of your faith or the proclaiming or the agreement or the association of your faith, when you begin to agree with what God says about you, it will bring faith. The word communication means to participate. 
So when you begin to participate, now listen, there's a lot of things you don't want to participate with people, what they say about you. You know, because a lot of times people will either, what, what are they doing? Either they, they, they're trying to butter you up, huh? Or they're trying to tear you down. So we're not talking about people here. We're talking about God. There's things that God has said about you that is true. Then there's other things that God wants you to be, but you are not. Now, this is the problem, and it's what we call the, 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 the word of faith movement. A lot of people are trying to say there's something they're really not. For instance, people are saying, I'm righteous in Christ, but yet they're living like the devil. So that, I'm going to show you, that statement is not right. You can't just say, praise God, I'm holy. Holiness is not a statement of faith. You can't just say, I'm holy. Now, you can say, Lord, make me holy, but you got to be holy. Because if you were just automatically holy, then how come the Bible tells us that be holy as he is holy? Correct? Now, we know Christ lives in us. How? By faith. I'm going to unscramble this. Say, unscramble this egg, Pastor Mike. Because, I mean, we didn't have, because I, I've been in this thing for almost 40 years, and I've, I've heard a lot of phony baloney, a lot of shallow teaching, a lot of misunderstanding. So people say, praise God, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Well, you're not the one we want to ask about that. Are you living right? We want to ask your family. We want to ask those around you. Because it says, he was made sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We got to be made into his right. Oh, for words, we got to begin to remember, he leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So if I'm just automatically righteous, right? Now I'm, I'm, I agree when you say, Jesus, come out of my heart. I, I repent of my sins. Forgive me. You are righteous at that moment. For in other words, you are in right standing. But you're going to go on out, and what are you going to do? So if I'm out here and I'm committing adultery, I'm lying, I'm stealing, I'm cheating, I, I, I'm ignorant, I'm ugly, I'm nasty, I'm mean. Don't confess that stuff, Pastor Mike. Well, you've got to deal with these things if they're in your heart. You can't deny them because then you're a liar. You say, man, I'm so sweet, I'm so nice, I'm so understanding. And you've got people standing behind you and going, shaking their head. No, they're not. No, they're not. And they turn around and they go, because you're intimidating them. You're a liar. That's not the acknowledging of every good work. What's the acknowledging of every good work? My God meets all my needs according to his riches and glory. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. If God be for me, who can be against me? So you got to discern what it is that you acknowledge and what it is that you're just confessing that it's just a bunch of baloney. Y'all with me still? So listen. I've got to believe, it says, for as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Now, when I accepted Christ Jesus, it tells us there in 1 John, it says that, that beloved, be, be, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed us upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. So when I accept the Christ, I become a son of God. I, I acknowledge that, just like the prodigal son was the son of the father, but he took all of his father's wealth, and he went out, and he lived riotous living, not righteous living, but right, self-centered, self-pleasing. And he could have said, who, and, and if he could have been in the bar, and you would have caught him drunk, or some immoral thing was going on, he says, Hey, I, I think I know your daddy. Isn't your daddy that wealthy Lord that lives at such and such a place in such a town? Oh, yeah, that's my daddy. I'm his son. Well, it don't matter if you're son. You're a dead son. You got to repent. You got to believe. You got to come back home. So there, there's, God help us, man. We need, some, we, we need some balance to this teaching, man. You'll hear people, I'm righteous, I'm righteous, I'm righteous, I'm righteous. And the world is saying, Man, he's a thief, he's a liar, he's a backstabber, he's a gossiper. If that's righteous, I don't want nothing to do with your God. Huh? So you got to step into that righteousness. you got to possess that righteousness by faith in Christ Jesus. So it says that the communication or the participation or the sharing of your faith may become effectual. Now the word effectual means powerful. 
The word effectual might become, mean to be energized, to be quickened. That the quickening of your faith. The what? See, your faith has got to be quickened. It's got to be quick. And remember the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. If he draws in you, he'll quicken your mortal body. He's got to quicken your faith until your faith becomes alive and active. Your faith rises up. You know, you know, you know a lot of people really, they, they ought to have a tombstone. And, 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 and people who say they know Christ and go out there and said, born again on December the 3rd, 1935, died December the 31st, 1940. And the rest of their Christianity, they were dead Christians. Their, their faith was alive for five years. And then their faith died. How can you, how, you know be, how they live? You got to have faith that crucifies your flesh, not crucifies anybody else. See, if you got faith that wants to kill somebody in their sin, that wants to attack, that wants to belittle, that wants to put down, that wants to, that wants to torment people, that is not faith. That is the devil working in you. Amen? Now, all of us have let the devil at, at times work in us, haven't we? But it says that, it, and we're in the book of Philemon, and it says, or Philemon, so how are you going to say it? Let's fillet you. It says that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of, say, every good thing. Every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For instance, I acknowledge by his stripes we were healed. I acknowledge that to myself. I'm not going around telling other people this. I'm talking to Mike Yeager. Now, I know you're probably not like me. You probably don't ever talk to yourself. Come on, man. You talk to yourself more than anybody else. Even if you don't move your lips, your brain is a-working. You are always talking to yourself. Right now, as I'm preaching, you're talking to yourself probably. Your mind is talking to yourself. You're saying, well, is this true? Is this true? Is that right? Can I relate? Can I? You don't even know you're talking to yourself. Have you ever seen, buddy, they, 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 they're walking around and their lips are moving and you say, hey, you're talking to yourself. Oh, I'm not talking to myself. You're talking to yourself all the time. So what are you saying to yourself? I'm going to acknowledge every good thing that God has done in me. Yeah. Go back to the book of Jeremiah. I'm going to show you this, how faith comes. This is the 16th way that faith comes by the acknowledging of every good thing that God has done for you. What good thing? My name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Oh, Lord, I thank you. Remember, Jesus said, rejoice because your name is written down in heaven. So, Lord, I rejoice for that my name is written down. Now, I've never seen my name in heaven, but he said it is, so I acknowledge it. I acknowledge I am, I have, and I can do what God says I can do. Amen. Now, Jeremiah was called of God from his mother's womb as a little boy. And, of course, he didn't know that. But God showed up one day in verse 4 of Jeremiah chapter 1. Listen. Then the word of the Lord came unto me. We don't know how old he was. He could have been a young teenager saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. How many know that God knew you in your mom's belly? Okay. And before thou camest forth out of the womb... I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Huh. So that means God had a plan for Jeremiah. You know, I believe that God has a plan for every person, but they just don't accept it. They reject it. They ignore it. They walk away from it. Many are called, but few are chosen. Or many, many. Matter of fact, God said, I would have all men to repent and come to the knowledge of the truth. But people do not embrace God's plan for their life. See, the difference between, I call them sheep and goats. Goats go, my will be done. Sheep go, your will be done. Bah. Bah. Lord, your will be done. Not my will. See, most of what they call the Christianity today is nothing but like just little cliques and clubs where people are just trying to impress one another. Tell somebody, I'm not impressed. <laughs> We're not, this is not a show so club. We're not trying to impress you. You know, if everybody say, Pastor Mike, you don't impress me. Good. I don't want to impress you. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to be your hero. Get out of here. If you're a Jaegerite, you're full of worms. And you need to take some deworming medicine. 
I, I want you to love Jesus. I want you to follow Jesus. I want you to know Jesus. And so he's speaking to this young man. He says, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Notice he did it in the belly. That's why every, every egg that is, is um, made alive by the seed of the man, conception, is a human being. But that can't, they can't be a human being being that small to where you've got to use a microscope. It don't matter what you think. God says that's a human being. The mi matter of fact, before you were even formed in your mother's womb, before you were developed, I knew you. I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. Before you came out of the womb, I sanctified you and ordained you a prophet to the nations. But now, he doesn't hear the voice of God until maybe he's a young man. That doesn't mean that God didn't call him. Then said, listen, in verse 6, he heard this declaration from God. Then said, I, our Lord God. Now, I like the Hebrew, because in, 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 in the Hebrew, it doesn't, it, it doesn't say, ah, it, it, it says, alas, alas. Jeremiah, he heard this call of God. He heard the voice of God. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. We don't know how. There's 20 different ways that God speaks to us scripturally, biblically. But somehow God spoke to him. Dream, vision, inward witness, audible voice. Don't know. But God spoke to him and said, I've made you. I've created you to be a prophet. And he goes, Jeremiah hears this. And he goes, I, oh, he said, Alas, alas, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I'm a, I'm a child. I can't do this. I'm just a kid. So when you hear the word of the Lord for you, your flesh would rise up and say, I can't, I can't li overcome sin. I, I, I can't overcome the devil. I, I can't give God everything. I, I can't love the Lord with all my heart, soul, mind, strength, and being. And listen what God says to him in verse 7. But the Lord said unto me, unto Jeremiah, he wrote the book, Say not, say, say that, say not. Say not. Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. The word of the Lord came. Now you're going to find out, we don't have time to get into this. But you're going to find out that from that moment forward, he never argued with God again. Now Mary, she had an angel come. Blessed art thou among women. You're going to have a child. You're going to conceive. His name is going to be Emmanuel. You're going to give birth to the Son of God himself. And Mary didn't argue. Mary says, well, how is this going to be since I know not a man? And said, the Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. And that which you conceive within your womb is going to be holy. And you know what she said then? You know what she said? From that moment forward, she never argued. She said, let it be done to me according to thy word. See, it takes faith to do that. Okay, Father, you told me to do that. I don't know how it's going to work. I don't know how it's going to happen. You told me to go here. You told me to go there by your word. You told me, okay, God, I'm doing it. You know what? People read the book. People, I'm talking about people who say they know Jesus. They read the Bible, the New Testament, and they won't do what it says. There's a spirit of unbelief that has swallowed them up. And when you get swallowed up with unbelief, you get swallowed up with pride and hate and bitterness and lust and anger and fear and anxiety and worry and confusion and frustration. I don't know that you, none of you ever experienced any of these things. But you get swallowed up by it. Well, what are you going to do when you don't trust God, when you're not believing God? You'll get swallowed up by the world. I don't want to be swallowed up by the stinking world. He's called, the, he's called the liar, the thief, the devil. I don't want to get swallowed up by that. How about you? So how do I get faith to come? I acknowledge what God says is true. So I believe from that moment forward, Jeremiah began to walk around and say, I am a prophet. I am a prophet. I've been called since my mother's womb. I am sanctified. And what else did God tell him? He said, be not afraid of their faces, for I am, I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. So he takes this promise. He says, Lord, you said you are with me to deliver me. And Lord, he's talking to himself. He's not telling anybody else this. The whole book of Jeremiah is what he's telling the nations and what God is telling him. But he doesn't show you his own personal prayer life. If you could have snuck into his own personal time of prayer, you would have heard him repeating what God said about him. Why? Because that's how faith comes. You acknowledge every good thing. Don't, don't acknowledge what people say about you. 
Don't repeat what people, don't repeat what people say about you. He, they're not your foundation. They're not the rock you build your life on, praise God. You build your life on Jesus Christ. How do you think this place came to pass? I mean, this was nothing but a cornfield, and I had no money, and we only had 70 people in the church. How did it happen, Pastor Mike? When the Spirit of God spoke to me, he said, I want you to go over there, and I want you to put up this size of building. I don't want it to be a glamorous building because it ain't going to be around for many years. He said, and I want you to declare it. So I came over here. There was nothing here, and I began to walk the ground, and I began to acknowledge it. Lord, you told me to do this. You said this building would be here. You said that we would sit at least 800 people people lord you you and lord i'm just doing what you told me to do so lord i acknowledge it i acknowledge it i didn't get on the airwaves and blab my big mouth off i just acknowledged it to my own heart so what is god telling you by his stripes you were healed lord i acknowledge i'm healed by your stripes your word says i'm healed by your, your word says because i'm a tither See, that's connected to giving to God. You supply all my needs according to your riches and glory. I'm not going to be afraid of the faces of man, for what can man do unto me? So you begin to acknowledge, if God before me, who can be against me, correct? Are, are you getting, is, is any faith coming yet? Amen. There, there, how, what's faith, Pastor Mike? A little bit of peace. Now, there'll be conviction too. And conviction is good, because when Daddy takes you over his lap to whip your butt, that's good. Amen. I mean, you know, you all need a good whipping. Man, I'm telling you what, a lot of people say, oh, Daddy, God, just hold me in your lap and just rock me back and forth and sing Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. No, he ain't doing that, man. He takes me over his lap and goes, whap, whap, whap. I go, oh, God, I needed that. Thank you for that. Be not afraid, he said. I would deliver you. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. See, when you begin to, when you don't resist God, he'll touch your mouth. Say, touch my mouth. Why does he need to touch your mouth? Because that's what part of your tongue, you know, it says death and life is in the power of the tongue, and they that love it eat the fruit thereof. There's power in your tongue. Say, there's power in my tongue. No, no, there's power in your tongue. There's life and death. Matter of fact, it tells you can tell if a person's spiritual by what comes out of their mouth and what wags their tongue. What wags the tongue? Because if the tongue ain't under control, it means what's in the heart ain't good. See, your tongue is the bucket that dips into the well of your heart, and you can't dip a bucket into a, 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 a well full of sewage and come up with nothing but sewage. Now, a lot of people, they say, well, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta change, you gotta get a different bucket. The problem is the bucket. How many know the problem is really not the bucket? It's what the well is dipping into. And it says in the book of James, how can sweet water and bitter water come out of the same well? It says, be not many masters, knowing that you shall receive the greater condemnation, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to brighter the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships that, though they be so great, the old sailing ships, and are driven of fierce winds, yet they turned about with a very small helm whatsoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Your little tongue will get you in trouble faster than anything else. Because the guy who's got a hold of the steering wheel, who's got a hold of your tongue? You do. Where you gonna, where, where you gonna, when you're driving down a road and all of a sudden you're driving a car and you go, oh, and you, you have a terrible accident, right? And a cop comes along. What happened? Oh, the car went over to the right-hand lane. What? The car went over to, well, who turned it over there? I don't know. He said, you turned it over there. You know, like a lot of people want you to know, and I'm not into guns and stuff, but they, yeah, we got to get rid of guns. Well, there's still knives. Well, we got to get rid of knives. There's still bats. We've got to get rid of bats. Well, there's still other stuff. It's the heart. The heart's got to be changed. The heart's got to be transformed. But see, now that you're born again, now that you're washed in the blood, now that you've surrendered your life to Jesus, you begin to acknowledge what God says about you. God, you said you would, if, I, if I would seek your face, if I would draw nigh to you, if I would draw, you would draw nigh to me. And so you begin to say what God's word says about you. Because the tongue is important. There's power in your tongue. Say, there's power in my tongue. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I put my what? 
words in thy mouth. What has God got put in your mouth? See, I, as a young baby Christian, because I, I was a mess. Seven years old, first time I got drunk at a Catholic wedding. And from then on, I drank. And, of course, I picked up cigarettes probably when I was about 11, 12 years old. And, I, and we'd all sit around in our kitchen table. My whole family all smoked Winstons. When I switched over to Raleigh, man, they, they were upset with me, but we all smoked Winstons. And we'd sit around the table and look like, like a cloud of glory, but it was no glory. And every one of us did smoke. Every single one of us smoked. Man, we're puffing away, man, three and a half packs of cigarettes a day. But then I had to dip into Swiss or sweets and cigars. And then I had to dip into uh, 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 Copenhagen and, and, and scroll and, and, and brown mule and not be stuffing that stuff. And it'd be bulging. And then, I, then I, of course, I had to go, you know, rip a wine and tequila and southern comfort. And then, of course, I had to start popping the pills, smoking the dope, not just hashies, but other things mixed with who knows what. And then I uh, had to go into pornography, and then I had to go into violence, and then I ran with a gang outside of Chicago, and I was a mess. But you know what happened? I confessed with my mouth the Lord Jesus one day. With my tongue, I confessed with my mouth, the Roman, Romans 10, and believed in my heart that Christ had died for my sins. And when I did that, the old Mike Yeager died. I couldn't quit that stuff. I tried. But on my 19th birthday, as I was trying to commit suicide with a knife, I was going to kill myself. And the fear of God fell on me. And I fell to my knees. And I said, Jesus, I need you. I'm a mess. Oh, I'm so lost. Oh, God, I'm so lost. I need you. I give you my heart, my mind, my life. He didn't take it unless I gave it. See, he won't take it unless you give it. I gave him my heart. And he changed me. I'm so glad he changed me. See, that old Mike Yeager died. Now, that old Mike Yeager, it's almost like a monster movie, you know? He keeps trying to crawl up out of the tomb. That old Mike Yeager, geez, you know what I got to do? I got to go over and kick him in the face, knock him down, stomp on him, take the sword and hack him. And somehow he always tries to come out of that tomb, comes out of the grave. He tries to crawl out of the ground. Here you can see my hand coming up. I got to go kick his hand and say, you dirty dog, get down in the ground. <laughs> you're nothing but food for the worms. I don't know why you're still hanging around. You gotta die, you nasty little dog. <sighs> Listen what he says. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build and to plant. Now think about that. How can you say to a young man, a young teenager, I'm going to use you, Jeremiah. You're going to go to the nations. You're going to go to countries. You're going to go to the heathen. You're going to go to the kings. And you're going to root out, pull down, cast down, throw down. And you're going to build and plant. They're going to hate you. And he says this, and none of them are going to listen to you. That's what he told them. Pastor Mike, I don't know why I get so discouraged because of lack of faith in Christ. Well, I don't know why I didn't have any success. Well, God didn't ever tell uh, Jeremiah he was going to have success, but he obeyed God. And they used the book of Jeremiah 70 years later after the 40 years. See, he was in a ministry for 40 years to, before they took him down to Egypt. And then, uh, and then after 70 years after the captivity, they came back. Like he, like Jeremiah, see, oh, I'm telling you, Jeremiah gave such, such amazing prophetic words, and they used his words in a land of the Chaldeans, and, and Daniel studied it, and, and, and the prophets, and they said this, and, his, and, 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 and Hezekiah, and all of them, and they said, this is when Jeremiah said we would leave. It happened exactly. Wouldn't you love to be so in tune with God that you would tell people exactly what was going to happen? I've been there. It's scary. I've been there. I've told people, I said, you're going to be dead in three months. And they were dead in three months. I told one young man one time, he wouldn't listen to me. He was a Muslim. I went to his room weeping as a young Christian. I said, the Lord told me the devil's going to kill you. You better repent. He said, Mike, I'm not ready. And it wasn't very long after they found him dead with his head in the toilet from an overdose. And Hassan was very reasonable when it comes to drugs, not like some of us guys. He got some bad drugs. I'm telling you, man, this is serious business. You know that? Go to Genesis before we close here. Genesis chapter 3. We're talking about how faith comes. We've been teaching the 20 ways that faith comes. And those who of you who are watching right now by TV, by satellite TV, let me encourage you. You can go to our website. It's up on, on, on the screen. 
and you can go ahead and watch these videos for free at our YouTube channel. You can subscribe there. But God speaks to, Jeremiah, to, to Abraham. God speaks to Abraham, takes him, and he says, Abraham, and actually his name was Abraham. Abraham, come out of the city of the Chaldeans. And so he obeys. Listen, what God will do is God isn't just, he's just going to give you little things to do. Say little things. Little things, and then they're gonna, the tests are going to get bigger. Like when you go into kindergarten or preschool, they give you a little test right now. If you and I were given a preschool test right now, most likely we would laugh and say, come on, are you joking with me? That's nothing. But at the beginning, for, for you when you were in preschool, that was a big deal to stack the blocks. Okay, now stack the blocks. You'd get four high and they'd fall over. You'd get frustrated. We think it's stupid now, but you know what? In, in, but so God, God always, he's going to give you little baby steps. How many know that? Aren't you glad that babies are not like deer or horses? You give birth to them and up, they're running. Oh, that'd be a nightmare. Oh, there you just gave birth. Can you imagine in the hospital, your wife gives birth, and you come to see your little Johnny, and, and they say, where's Johnny? There he goes, running down the hallway. <laughs> oh, no, no, little Johnny ain't going to be running for, you know, some time. He's going to have to learn to crawl. He's going, you know what, sometimes I still think I'm learning how to crawl in this stuff. After almost 40 years, I'm a slow learner sometimes. It's, sometimes I still feel my diapers and suck, suck my thumb. I, don't, I know you all don't do that. And Abraham fell on his face because God showed up. He got out of the city of the Chaldeans in verse 3 and talked with him, saying, and he's going to begin to talk to him, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Now he has got one son called Ishmael, and Ishmael is a work of the flesh. Ishmael ain't the one, you understand. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abraham. Now listen, he said, your name ain't Abraham, singular, and this is chapter, uh, chapter 17, verse 5. Genesis, did I give you the chapter? Oh, okay. Okay, it's chapter 17, verse 5. My mind is in different directions here. What's going on, Pastor Mike? I am going through a tremendous trial of faith right now, and I can't share it with you. So my mind is a little bit scattered, and I won't share with you the trial of faith I'm going through. Why? Because God is big enough. God is big enough. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abraham, but thy name shall be called Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee an exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. I want you now to get a hold of this. See, his name is Abraham. That's his name. It means singular. But he said Abraham means father of many nations. That's what it means in Hebrew. He said, I'm going to change your name from Abraham to Abraham. And do you know from that minute forward, he never let anybody call him Abraham again. He made everybody call him Abraham. My name ain't Abraham, it's Abraham. Well, where's all your kids? Don't worry about it. Where's all your descendants? Don't worry about it. You got one kid, his name is Ishmael. Don't worry about it. My name is Abraham. See, by the acknowledging of every good thing that he does in you, faith comes. Every time, Abraham. Now, actually, he goes on a little bit. He says, Lord, how can this be? I, I, I don't, how is this going to happen? And, and, and this can't be. As a matter of fact, look there in verse 15. And God said unto Abraham, as for Sarai, thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. Sarah, listen what that means. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she'll be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Kings will come out of her womb. Now, so he just switched Sarai's name to Sarah. So you got to let in your heart, you got to let God... Switch your name. He switched Jacob. Jacob means deceiver. He deceived his brother Esau out of the inheritance. He changed his name because he wrestled with God. If you will wrestle with God, he will change your name from cursed to blessed, from sad to happy, from broke to prosperous. Amen. He'll change your name. Amen. But you've got to wrestle with God. It takes faith. 
How many are really willing to wrestle with God? You got to wrestle with God. You got to wrestle with God. It says, and I will bring nations out of her and kings out of her. Listen to what Abraham said. Now, listen, I want you to find out where, because he has not yet, he's not yet acknowledging what God has said about him. He still thinks he's Abraham, but he's Abraham. God said, you're Abraham. No, I'm not. I'm Abraham. No, you're Abraham. No, I'm not. I am Abraham. Now, he ain't saying nothing yet. Her name is Sarah. No, her name ain't Sarah. It's Sarai. Uh, your name is, is, is Israel. You're a prince with God. No, my name is Jacob. I'm the deceiver. No, no, your name is no longer Jacob. Your name is Israel. Let me ask you something. What's your name now? See, when I was a kid growing up, people used to call me Mikey. Well, you don't call me Mikey no more. I've had some guys who rented from me, and they, hey, Mikey, and I said, I am not Mikey. I am Mike. Hello? I'm not mad about it, but no, I'm not Mikey. You're no longer Richie. You're rich. Or Cephas. Cephas. <laughs> Look what it says. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed. Listen, he's laughing out of what? Unbelief. Oh, yeah, right. Tell me another joke, right? Oh, yeah, uh-huh. And said in his heart, where? In his heart, shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old, and Sarah that is ninety years old bear? Listen, I don't know why he did change her name. He didn't, he didn't, but for some reason he couldn't in his mind change his name. He, I'm Abraham. Okay, you want me to call my wife Sarah? See, it's always easier to apply the word of God to somebody else. Well, trust God. Just believe God. Don't you know your needs are met? Don't you know you're healed? Well, let's bring it home. Come on, man. Let's bring it right to your heart. You're no, lo no longer Abraham. Your name is Abraham. And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee, because that is the child he had through Hagar, which was a concubine of Sarah. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. It means laughter. Who gets the last laugh? God gets the last laugh. <laughs> and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. So I want you to notice there had to be a name change in his heart. He had to see things differently. Listen, people get born again. They accept Christ. They even maybe get filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking a heavenly language, but there's no change in their mind. It says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that it's a good, except perfect will of God. There's going to be a change in your head, man. As a man thinketh, so is he. Stinking thinking's got to go. You got to change. Listen, I, I know how I used to think. Let's close in 1 John. Listen, be, I, I didn't know any Christians. I really didn't. I mean, I was a Catholic. But I didn't really know any devout Catholics. My parents weren't. They just sent us to Catholic school and sent us to Catholic church. I mean, in my mind, my mind was always thinking about me, 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 my, my next fix, my next beer, my next puff of pot, my next car I was going to strip driving down the road. I remember one time, it ain't funny, one time we, we, uh, we pulled up to a, a, they had state trucks, and we, it was a rainy night, dark out, perfect time to strip, you know, get gas and whatever, get batteries, so we're pulled up, man, I was only 15 years old, we pulled up, man, we're sneaking through the mud, going to strip this car, and all of a sudden a cop car comes around the corner, saw him, we knew he saw us, I'm running for the car, I lost my shoe and went down into the mud, sunk down in. I'm running without no shoe on my left foot. I'm the first guy to the driver's car. I jump in, man. My feet's all muddy. We're all muddy. Everybody is in the car. I put it in gear and took off. Cops chasing me, and there was a roadblock up. Turned off my lights, turned off the engine, and coasted around the roadblock. Kept my foot off the brake, and should I say, thank God the cop didn't see me? But see, that was my mindset. 
my mindset was, let's go out and cause some trouble. Let's go get some drugs. Let's pick up some girls. But when I got born again, something shifted inside of me, but I embraced the will of God. See, I embrace the heart of God. I embrace the nature of God. And there was a shift in my head. And I began, without nobody telling me, I began to acknowledge I was a new creature in Christ Jesus because I was seeking him. Now, as we close in 1 John, let me tell you, I'm going to give you a little bit of a dip. There's people going around saying, I'm righteous, I'm righteous, I'm righteous. Jesus made me righteous. But they're as filthy as, as a pig in a pan. And they're no more righteous than a pig in a pen is. But let me tell you, they're doing what King Saul did. See, remember, Samuel the prophet told King Saul, Saul, now you've got to go to the, the Amalekites and, the, and, and King Agag because they are wicked. See, the only reason God killed people in the, in the land of Canaan because they were wicked people. I mean, they would kill your kids, rape your kids, murder your kids. I mean, these were murderers. You know what I mean? Just absolute murderers. I mean, if you can imagine, I guess, and I haven't seen them, but if they, they've made some modern movies where they, they dropped the wicked men off onto an island and, they let, and a, a good guy gets dropped into the midst of them, it's either be killed or be killed, kill or be killed. Well, that's what happened to the Israelites. They were in the land of Canaan, and it was either kill or be killed. I mean, so God told Saul, go in there and wipe out the Amalekites. So King Saul goes in. He kills all the Amalekites, but he ke keeps King Agag alive. Now, I don't know why, maybe because King Agag knew where the, the gold and the silver and the precious jewels were, and he didn't tell anybody. He said, I'm not going to tell you where the treasure is unless you keep me alive. And then he kept all the livestock alive. Now, why, why would God tell him? I'm telling you honestly, why would God tell him to kill all of the animals? Because they were full of sexually transmitted diseases, honestly. Society can't get that perverted, Pastor Mike. Oh, yes, it can. And it's getting there. People are getting twisted, man. I mean, you think what they wanted now to do between, they want to make legal between men and men and women and women. Now they're after making it legal between adults and children. And now there's another group clamoring for grown-ups and animals. Oh, yes, they are. It's the Pandora's box. Who's the one who draws the line? There ain't no God. We can do whatever makes us feel good. And it's Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's why God wiped them out. We better get our minds straight. Faith. See, when faith begins to die, the sewage of perversion begins to rise. Less faith in Christ, not faith in religion. Less faith in Christ, the deeper the darkness. More faith you have in Christ, the more joy peace, long-suffering, gentleness, and love, and goodness, and kindness you'll have. That's what I want. How about you? So Samuel comes along, and he says, uh, Saul, did you do what I told you to do? Oh, yes, 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 I did. I, I, I did exactly what the Lord told me to do. He says, well, if you did exactly what the Lord told you to do, then how come I hear the bleeding of animals in my ears? And who's that man? Who's that man? Oh, that's King Agag. Well, I told, God told you to kill the sheep, kill the livestock, and kill that man. Oh, I did everything God told me to do. I, I'm obedient. That's what Christians are doing now. I'm a child of God, but they're living like the devil. I'm righteous. You're no more righteous than a, a pig is clean who's living in a pig pen. What do you do? Acknowledge it. See, I think if King Saul would have said, I'm guilty, you're right, I listened to the people. You're right. I should, I should have obeyed you. He would, he would not have lost his kingship. You know what happened to King Saul? The Bible says he committed suicide. He fell on a sword and killed himself. Before he killed himself, he went, because what did Samuel tell him? He said, Wit, oh, disobedience is a sin of witchcraft. So acknowledging the good works in you is not saying something that is a lie. It's you saying, Lord, for instance, I don't have to pray that God goes with me as long as I'm with him. And if I'm not with God, uh, here's another illustration as we close here. Eli had two sons. They went to battle the Philistines. They lost. So the two sons of Eli, they go back to the temple. Well, there was no temple. It was the tabernacle. They get the Ark of the Covenant. 
They said, okay. So they bring the Ark of the Covenant into the camp of the Israelites, and there's a mighty shout to where the earth shakes, and the Philistines say, oh, what's going on? Oh, the God, the God that delivered the Israelites out of the hand of Egyptians, he's coming to the camp, and they were so full of fear because they say, we can't stand against this God. But guess what happened? It says, well, we're going to be dead men anyways. Let's fight like men. Come on, we know this Israelite God is going to kill us. He's going to wipe us all out. Because remember, Jonathan and his armor bearer, they, 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 they wiped out a whole army of us. But what else can we going to do? We, we can't, we're going to. So they attacked the Israelites. Well, lo and behold, they defeated the Israelites and captured the Ark of the Covenant. Why? Because God wasn't with them. They had a lot of shout, but no power. There's people today in the church, they have a lot of shout, but they have no power. Why? Because they're not right with God. Y'all still here? You getting anything out of this? Okay, so we do close in 1 John 4.4. 4. Look what it says here, 1 John 4.4. 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Notice the context. How come you overcome them? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. See, confession is not just because you say it. It brings reality. When you say God and you set your heart to God. Now, you, in other words, you don't have a wedge of gold and you don't have a Babylonian garment underneath your tent flat where God said don't have that, right? You, you got your tent clean. Y'all got your tent clean? You by, you, by faith, clean it up, and now you're okay. But see, Achan, God told him when they surrounded uh, Jericho, they said, now listen, Jericho's going to come falling flat down. On the seventh day, on the seventh time when you shout, boom, it came down. He said, but don't take none of the Babylonian. Don't take none of the gold. It's all corrupted. Don't take none. That, don't take no garments. And, 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 and he came back, dug a hole under his tent and buried it and he got caught and as long as he hid that he had no power in his life so he could have confessed all he wanted I'm a child of God I'm a child of God I'm a child no no first I'm not saying about perfection I'm saying the things that you know that are wrong you acknowledge it you repent of it you say now Lord help me and father thank you now by the blood of Christ I am forgiven and you are the thief on the cross. Lord, remember me when you come into the, your kingdom. Today you'll be with me in paradise. That's how fast you can be forgiven. But now you acknowledge I'm a child of the king. Oh, Lord, as far as I know, I'm living in your righteousness. You said you would never leave me, forsake me. You said if I call on to you, you would answer me and show me great and mighty things. Amen. Did you get something? Amen. 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 Give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. Thank you, Lord. So you can stop the recording.